My name is Lina Strandbachman, and uh, I'm the manager of, of the unit called Innovation Platform, Innovations Platform. Um, our unit, sort of the overall mission of our unit is to really to create a very strong uh, innovation system within the region of Västra Götaland. Uh, by that, I mean, what do we mean by that? I mean, it could be everything from uh, process support, a lot of guidance on legal requirements related to innovation. Um, we do have an innovation fund within the region of Västergötaland where innovators could apply for money. And a lot of system requirements for good innovation is, of course, also related to collaboration with people within the healthcare system and, of course, uh, people or companies outside academia and other external parts. We all have different roles. So that was sort of the elevator pitch of my unit. And uh, I think I stopped there, actually. And the CEO mentioned you as an enabler. Yes. You in, as an individual and your organization as Definitely a group. my organization. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anders. Uh, my name is Anders Jepson. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon here at the Sagrensk University Hospital. I'm also a professor. Um, my background is that I have a research in, in infections. And actually, two of the studies that Professor here showed us today was actually performed here. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the work of Linda Timur Bergström that actually was a research nurse at that time. And she performed a single center study, randomized study in 400 patients almost by herself. So that's her work much more than mine. Excellent. Um, th there are so many questions that I want to ask, but you have mentioned, many of you have mentioned that there is uh, a lot of knowledge in this area, and we are not using that knowledge. Uh, so, in effect, we're creating, uh, well, the infections by not using the best possible techniques and technologies. Are we any better than uh, Semmelweis's colleagues of the in the 1800s? Uh, Dr. Leeper, please, you. if you would like to. <laughs> I think one of the biggest problems I have is that our surgery is so quick nowadays. I mean, after a hip or a knee replacement, you're home on the third day. After colorectal surgeon, often you're up and about and off home on the third or fourth day. And the median time to an SSI, even a superficial one, is eight to ten days. And I think a lot of them, they're mostly superficial, present in primary care, where they're not trained to manage them. And uh, a patient who complains of even wound pain in primary care will almost certainly get one aspect of treatment, which is antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why we've got resistance problems. But I think, you know, if we had a kind of uh, bigger support, uh, maybe a government drive, I don't know, but it, it's the multifactorial, multidisciplinary look at this, which I think could win. Um, I suppose the only way we'd know now is if any patient had a problem, and I think that's where your app's going to work, they could come back to you and say, well, I don't like the look of that wound, come to the clinic tomorrow, so that we'd have much better surveillance and much more appropriate treatment than avoiding antibiotics. You'd remove a clip or two from the wound you showed. I mean, it wouldn't need an antibiotic. So, I mean, it's... I mean, I'm making a plea for mm. bundle of <laughs> compliance and all that, but, you know, I think the surveillance and management of a wound, and even mm. the definition of is an SSI a dehiscence, is, there's still a lot to do mm. with it. And it's real basic stuff, really. How about the rest of you? Are, are you involved in the bundles? as an approach to a joint effort, uh, if you will, of actions to reduce SSIs. Anders. Uh, um, first of all, I had to mention that we were on the top or even on the bottom of your list with the, the Annette that you showed this morning, uh, about 5% of our patients, which is heavily underestimated, I would say 10% instead of 5%. So we have absolutely a problem, but I think there are hurdles today in the organization, because most of these patients are not coming back to us, those mm -hmm. with infections. They're going to the GPs, they're going to other hospitals, and so on. So the efforts that we would do, and even sometimes uh, expensive eff efforts to reduce the number of SSIs, are not uh, gaining us in the end. I mean, the costs are somewhere else, and, and if we 
so I think we need to think, uh, take a look at this in a broader view that actually we, we uh, take care of our own infections. Could Claus's uh, application, uh, the follow-up IT system, help? If, and if you were then to incentivize your department so that good post-operative results in terms of infection would benefit you. There would be good payments or higher payments for good results in this area and poor reimbursement if you fail. Anders, yeah, because you're running a department. Uh, and I... Yeah, I mean, the first thing is, is uh, to actually acknowledge the number of infections that we have in mm. one way or another. If we call the patient, if we use an app, or if we contact the GPs or whatever, it it's, might not, in the, at least in the beginning, be not so important. Someone has said that, utan, uh, utan spaning, ingen aning, mm. and I think that's very good. We need mm. to, to acknowledge yeah. the, the problems we have. Mm. So that's the first thing. And I, I think, of course, that, a, that an app would mm. probably... On the other hand, we're operating patients from the whole Western uh, Sweden. Mm. And it's, it's, if they have a superficial infection, it makes no sense that they come back to us for that. So, so we need to cooperate. Mm. But, but of course, it's, we are um, uh, responsible for these infections that we must uh, take on us. Uh, Anette, have you looked into the, because we're talking about organizational structure, or, or Anders mentions the, the organizational structure as uh, a hindrance in doing the right thing. Uh, because just the, the love of the patient and the, mm, the pride taken in your job, that, that, that's not enough. There needs to be something else in place, obviously. Um, so the silo budgeting uh, that we're talking about, what, uh, because you, you've looked at this more extensively, what do, would you propose? Yeah, a little bit. I think what Anders said about awareness about the problem is important among uh, the professionals, but also among uh, our leaders in the organization. And uh, we need to understand that we have to uh, uh, put time and invest in uh, preventing infections uh, and uh, make space in the organization for learning uh, and using our failures if infections we can see them as failures use this to to learn together how we can do a better work uh, i think that is so important because yes we have a strained economy and we have a huge production pressure but we can't as we say in swedish roms oss ur en uppförsbacke we can decelerate up the hill uh, or to some effect. Yeah. And the saying that Anders had was, uh, without reconnaissance, you don't know where you're going. Yeah. Or so uh, th there are things that don't translate really well here. <laughs> it, it was brilliantly worded by both Anders and Anette, just for your information. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Klaus, with the, I would call it an innovation, what you're, you're putting in place, or you're developing it, and, and now it's ready for testing. Would you say that the interest has been uh, at the level it should be, uh, considering the, the magnitude of the problem here? You mean the total problem? Yeah, the total problem of... Uh, well, surgical site infections for, for simplicity, but the follow-up that you're enabling. I think it's two parts. Uh, uh, the specific surgeon is very interested of a post-operative infection, of course, because it destroys the result. But I think the interest in the, all the arrangement around it with clothes and uh, specific uh, routines... Mm. Uh, the interest is not very big on that. I think it's partly because I think people think that there are coming a lot of unstructured moves uh, and only more and more. I think uh, 
is talk about a bundle, I think it's very important to don't widen it too much. You should have a specific, do this. Hmm? It, it comes small, small things, and you don't know what is that. <coughs> and, uh, it loses interest hmm. of that. Dr. Lieber, would you agree? Yeah, I fully that, endorse that, yeah. yeah. I think um, a care bundle may be five, ma max six. But when you start trying to do 29 recommendations like WHO doing, and that's across the ward, the theatre, recovery room, back to the ward, and also outpatients and home and primary care. So it's almost impossible to do, I suspect. But five things around the time of surgery, I would guess, if we believe what the results show us, would reduce the, the risk of 90% of those infections, uh, if we could capture that. Um, but, you know, it's patients turn up to theatre cold. I mean, I go to hospital, I have been to hospitals looking at high SSI rates. Um, and uh, this business about not putting the warming device on, yeah, it's common, but even the WHO Safe Surgery Saves Lives, you know, if you actually stand in the corner and watch how the compliance is, it's rarely better than 30%. Mm. People are just backing off and they kind of do it, but it's not done with that strict airline pilot type mm. care. Do you know what I mean? The, the mm. precision just isn't as good as it probably ought to be. Mm. So if you list the five oh. most important again, and then we can have sort of a show of hands from the audience if this is something that you, in your respective professional roles, adhere to, or the organization that you're part of? I think you've got to first accept that theatre discipline, has, it may be right or it may be wrong, but theatre discipline has come around from a thousand years of practice, or certainly mm -hmm. the last 150, 200. Let's assume that theatres are clean, that the ventilation's good and mm -hmm. your yeah. instruments are sterile. Let's assume all that. All the checks are in place for that. So what can we do actively that we're not doing as well as we might now? I would put, not in any great order, no. as they say, X Factor stuff list. Um, be warm, I think, would be on mm. my list. Antibiotic prophylaxis mm. would be on my list. So be warm. Is that something that we do well here? Do we turn on the equipment to keep the patient warm? Annette, uh, and, and actually, we, I would like to involve the audience here because we have a lot of people who are involved in, in surgery here. Yeah, we, we did a study on that mm -hmm. uh, in our hospital, and I can say there are room for improvements, huge room for improvements, mm -hmm. actually. We, we need to work on that, and we could start already when the patient is prepared for surgery at the ward. I agree. Mm -hmm. To keep them warm during all the, the whole perioperative process. I think that would be great for, for our patients. And there are methods of doing that, as mm. you know. Mm. I mean, I think when patients come for a hip or a knee replacement nowadays, it's all done with local. Mm. And whilst they're having their epidural, and if their back's a bit crunchy and you can't quite get that epidural mm. in, they can be 30, 40 minutes mm. sat on the edge of the no. Operating table, waiting to have that work, yeah. and they get really cold. So it's not just in the so OR; it's, it's a, the yeah. Lost, yeah. Um, would you agree, also, that, or do you do you see that you have more to do in this area? Yeah, yes, especially on uh, uh, smaller surgery, mm. on the bigger surgery like uh, uh, liver and things like that. Then, then you look at it. But if you make a hernia or something, I don't think uh, that's done every time. Oh. Yes. yes, of course. I can't help asking a question to my colleagues here. <laughs> um, when you think about following these care bundles, or whatever it is, I mean, keep the patient warm, etc., do you think the biggest thing is that to change behavior of the people working there, or would it also help to <coughs> have some kind of automatic surveillance system, like a technical solution to actually measure and give an alarm or stop the surgery to proceed or something if you haven't. In the plan. Yeah. Is, yeah. Do plan you think that was plan. just a question to you? Do you think it would help or does it, uh, does it matter? To Maybe in the beginning, but if you have a bundle with not a lot of things, mm -hmm. I think it will get, be a routine in a very, very short time. There is an Irish group which puts these things in the cloud. 
Mm. And until something like putting on the switch clicks it on the cloud tick list. But if it doesn't, it, there's a thing out of the cloud saying, you must not proceed. You've not completed the checks. Mm. And it seems to work for them. Mm. But surgeons don't like that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> tick lists and surgeons. Yeah. Mm. And the next on the list was the prophylactic antibiotics. Yeah. I think so. But again, it needs to be one agreed by your trust because your microbiome is going to be different trust to trust. And uh, it needs to be the right dose. I mean, patients having bariatric surgery are going to need probably double the dose to have an MIC at the right level in tissues during surgery. And that gets overlooked sometimes, you know. And if an operation is a particularly long one, maybe you should repeat the dose. Or if you have a big blood loss and bleed out the antibiotic should be repeated but all these things kind of get lost in the email. and the timing was important too I guess yeah. yeah. Anders yeah. Uh, I also think that prophylactic antibiotics is important um, <laughs> we have tried a couple of times during these uh, 25 years I've been working here uh, to change and actually some of the times when we have tried it had increased the, the the infection rate when we, we try to, okay. to shorten the time and, mm -hmm. and so on. I mean, I'm not 100% sure that it was because of the change prophylactic, because here's one of the problems, that we yeah. have clusters of infections, yeah. which means that it's very, very difficult from a scientific point of view to, to evaluate yeah. when you change something. I was impressed by the figure that you showed, Klaus, that you need to have a reduction of about 75% to, to be able to show. Mm. To show, effect. yeah. And, and this is something that, that actually uh, blocks us a bit yeah. when, when we're trying to do research in this area. Yeah. Because our worst uh, uh, SSI is metastinitis, mm. which is about 1% of our patients. And if we have got 2%, one year, instead of 1%, we have increased with 100%. Mm. Yeah. But, but could be a cluster, because yeah. there's a few, few events. Mm. And this is a, a real big problem. Yeah. But also, just, just for, yeah, the, please. for the discussion, yeah. I would say that we have... It's not as dark as we are now painting the picture. picture. Oh. I mean, when I started, patients with metastinitis, they were for 14 days in the ICU, uh, sedated or, or, or even... Um, uh, and had a mortality of 50%. Mm. And today we don't see any patient dying from metastinitis due to the back, yeah. due to, to other changes. Yeah. So actually we have achieved a lot if we go back 25 years. Mm. There's still a lot to do, but it's not that bad. I think it's important to point that out, really, that there is a development. But, but you've mentioned a couple of times here today that the, the, the hospital-acquired infections go down, but the SSIs don't at the same rate, or that we still have a problem. But We still have a problem, but we have been better to treat it. Yeah, which is very encouraging, uh, so that development happens, and we should pay attention to, to what it does. And the third on the list, then. We have the, the temperature of the patient and the prophylactic antibiotic. Say, um, skin preparation. Hmm? Right, so surgical site skin preparation. I think the evidence is pretty good that it works, hmm? um, but it's got to be done properly. Hmm. Did you include that in your study, Anita? No, hmm. we haven't. We haven't looked at that before. <laughs> uh, we tried to, to do design a study a couple of researchers around Sweden, and we wanted to, to, to evaluate the effect of chlorhexidine showers in patients undergoing heart surgery, open uh, heart surgery. And we concluded that we had to, to do a randomized study. We have to have at least 4,000 patients mm. in each arm. Every patient costs about 20,000 Swedish crowns to include in the study, and we, it had to be a multi-center study that would run yeah. for many years. And we came to the second round uh, for evaluation, but in the end, we were turned down our application because there were low interest, I would say, in these questions. Uh, That's so it's no. really difficult to do. Yeah. It points to your problem, or what yeah. you mentioned, Anders, that, that Anders the... the, the, the it is a problem. Mm. It's difficult to show. And it's, you have the clusters of infections and you have a multifactorial 
problem, I guess. Um, so the th- well, do you? So because you said you shouldn't shave, you should use clippers instead. Is that widely acknowledged? I think it is, but you know, it's, a lot of fuss is made of it, really. I mean, you could argue: Do you need to shave at all, or clip at all? Do you need to remove the hair? It's only when you've got a hairy beast, I suppose, you want to. But neurosurgeons don't remove hair for oh. surgery, so why should the rest of us? Oh. To reduce SSI, from a closing a hairy person, it, it's aesthetically difficult yeah. to do. Uh, but and I'm it, not sure the data is oh. so old as well. I wonder. Mm. And in, in your department, you have the, the the leg that you operate on, which is a problem in itself, I guess, with more infectious area and so on, and hair. And yeah, in, in coronary artery bypass surgery, we're using vein grafts. We, mm. we, we harvest the leg. And I mean, before we started our study with the, the with different uh, sutures, we uh, really tried to find out the true incidence. It was 20% in that that uh, so it's so it's very very common but we are now discussing we are not discussing if we should use hair removal or not we're discussing when we should do it okay because uh, there are some pros and cons of that as well so there are people claiming that we should do it the day before instead of the same morning and uh, uh, yeah i know Annette. <laughs> we, we need to discuss that again after the presentation. <laughs> Can I just throw yeah. something in? Yeah. Uh, there was a, uh, I think it's an operating department assistant came up with the idea that with the clipper had a little vacuum bag on the back. Mm. So the big problem with shaving or removing hair, I shouldn't say shaving, removing, depilating, is that in, say, emergency abdominal surgery and they're in the anaesthetic room and they're very hairy, you think, I really would like this guy to be de-haired. Mm. And you use this clipper with a bag and there's just no hair in the anaesthetic mm. room. It's all collected in this vacuum. Mm. It costs pennies. Mm. And I think if they market it, he's going to make a fortune. No. But it just seems a really sensible way forward if it's got mm. to be done. But, I mean, I think there's good evidence, isn't there? That if, you sh- if you use a razor, particularly two or three days before, and a lot of people ethnically shave themselves mm. and if they've got damaged skin, then they have a much higher risk of yeah. in the skin yeah. with leaking wounds, and they're likely to get infected. But uh, how true that is, I don't mm. know, in clinical practice. But that's the theory. Yeah. Mm. The fourth item on your care bundle list, then? I guess would have to be antibacterial sutures. I really do feel they have a part. Mm. And it seems that in just about every field of surgery, there is some evidence that they work. But the alternative is they're safe. Uh, there is no danger to them at all. Uh, I mean, millions of strands have been put in. There's not been one adverse reaction reported. So, yeah, there's an extra cost, but I'm sure, you know, with a bit of negotiation, uh, I don't think they'd cost any more personally. But uh, I, I don't speak for the company at mm. all, but uh, I think I'd put that as mm. in my five. Anders, you've, you've done... Trials. I'm, I'm also a believer, but I've also been informed that the decision to use them at different departments, uh, that they make different decisions out mm, there. Yeah. Some, sometimes decide to use them, and others say we had to think about triclosan and the environment and everything like that. Uh, I'm not sh- 100% sure who is actually deciding this, whether this is the profession or someone else, but, but I think it's worth at least discussing it once again. Mm. Uh, these um, meta analyses that now coming out are, are pretty uh, convincing in my, my eyes. Can I just all remind you, 80% of you will have triclosan in your urine because it's in your toothpaste mm. or it's in a food preservative you may have eaten. You're not actually American, perhaps it would be less than that. In an American audience <laughs> like you, 80% would have triclosan in their urine. Mm. After the use of antibacterial sutures, there is no measurable triclosan in urine. I mean, we're talking about micrograms. Mm. So I think the thing, that the, the danger that it's a worry is, is, mm. is nonsense, really. But there's no doubt antiseptics are used too much. Mm. I mean, I think silver is used in fridges. Mm. You have triclosan in dog bones and all sorts of things, mm. you know, to try and keep the water sterile with yeah. the dog. And that's ridiculous. Yeah. And it's, there's a huge amount in preservatives and makeup yeah. that uh, the girls mm. perhaps would use. 
Anders. Yeah, I mean, if it has any effect, we will then decrease the use of antibiotics, yeah. which, which, which I, we have to choose either or, but, but, but we cannot. I mean, if we have an effect on, on systemic infections and on antibiotic use, then, then it's, it's positive. Yeah. And antibiotics, we know for sure, will end up in the environment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Annette. Oh. oh, sorry, Peter. It's a question that's crossed my mind, but it takes a brave person to stop tradition. And I mean, you could argue in laparoscopic bariatric surgery, what is the point of giving prophylactic antibiotics? Even though it's clean contaminated GI surgery, the risk of a support infection after bariatric surgery is really low. And I can't believe, and you could argue the same for uncomplicated lap colis, you know, where the bile spillage is minimal, the gallbladder wall isn't inflamed or infected. I think for an emergency, I'd always personally prefer to have an antibiotic on board. But, yeah, perhaps we could stop using antibiotics quite as regularly as we did. And there's been a bit of recent stuff that I, I'm not terribly well acquainted with this, but people are telling me that, do we really need laminar airflow anymore? Um, HEPA filtration is pretty good. Um, is there any good evidence that the maintenance of laminar airflow theatres, which is expensive, is really worth the effort? And yet I've spoken to one of your surgeons earlier who's very concerned about traffic in his theatres, and I get that too, um, to the point of even locking the door when he's operating. <laughs> and I think orthopaedic surgeons, I, I can understand their concerns because they want everything to be right. But it's still the patient that gives the organisms that give you the infection. So maybe we could start looking at stuff, but if we start shortchanging on cleaning instruments, say, or... So we should stop patients. <laughs> <laughs> I'm recovering from a cold. Forgive me. <laughs> yes, yes. Let, let's yeah. stop operating. <laughs> That's one way of doing it. But yeah, I think we could look at a few things that are just traditional. Um, glove changing. I don't think there's any evidence that works. Changing gowns, using disposable gowns. They're all expensive. But uh, if we're going to start using negative pressure on primary incised wounds, and there's good evidence to show it works in the right indications, it's going to be another expense to fight your procurement manager with, you know? So, yeah, I think it's worth looking, but it's, it'll need to be very multidisciplinary to make those decisions. Mm. And drop one at a time, not just a whole sheet of stuff. You know? Annette, uh, I thought this would be interesting to hear yeah, from you. I think it's interesting because the problem is uh, we need to do things that are effective. Yeah. That, that we can agree on that. But, and when we now have a lot of studies, but we have inconclusive evidence on what is important mm -hmm. or not, combined with poor follow-ups. That, that gives us a very difficult situation and handle things. So I agree, if we should remove things that uh, biological reasoning, we can say, okay, this won't be, should not be a big problem in this type of surgery. We should do as you say, do, take a team decision, and follow the patients for a long time and do it on a special patient group. And that's a way to, to take out things that are not important. 
And I think also we have to understand what kind of surgery is, are, are we doing and what measures should be done in, in different surgeries. Because I think we, sh we need to customize uh, the use of different preventive innovations depending on what kind of surgery we do. And I think that in orthopedic surgery, which is my area, uh, the orthopedic surgeons have been successful because they have had a holistic view on infection prevention. So even if we say this is highly uh, infection-prone surgeries, we have very good uh, uh, infections rate after hip surgery, for instance. And that is because we have a really good teamwork, a common goal setting, and we have decided to use some very defined uh, infection preventive measures. And I think that could be applied to other types of surgery. And, and, and of course, it has to be the surgeons and the nurses and the team that works with these types of surgeries that had to come together and decide what should we do together. Because in, in, if, we, if it's the patient bugs, it could be in some types of surgeries, but we have some data from White and Tinker from the 80s showing that in orthopedic surgery, well, they, they estimate that 98% of what you can find in the patient wounds comes from the operating room and the air and the people that are moving there. So this can differ depending on type of surgery. Anders, you. I agree absolutely, but I want to come back to Peter's questions here about re reducing costs and, and, and so on. I mean, the most expensive things are the infections. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, starting by taking away things, uh, I, I wouldn't start there. Instead, of, uh, what I would think is, is uh, evaluating new ideas that should, should reduce it. So, so in, we should not add anything, but we should be very cautious to take away things that we think have any effect. Because if we increase the number of infection, we increase the cost for the hospital yeah. and for society. And we, we should remember what Marlin uh, told us, that the medical technology or cost of medical technology in healthcare is between 5 and 7%. So it's, that part is not, I mean, huge sums, uh, a little bit north of 20 billion Swedish krona a year in Sweden, but in relation to the 450 billion in Sweden, it's... Uh, less uh, or not substantial. Um, you, I think you mentioned, David, uh, initially that uh, we should call these iatrogenic, these events or accidents or accidents hap happen haphazardly, you would say, but if it's iatrogenic, it's caused by the the people in the health or the healthcare system, if you will. Uh, if, and I know that uh, people who uh, do research in patient safety, they consider all adverse events as iatrogenic, especially in wound-related infections. Do you think it, the attitude towards this area or infections would change if it were treated like it. Yeah, I do. Uh, I think I was on a committee for the UK looking at antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infections. It was dominated very much. I'm going to upset people now. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was dominated by microbiologists and they really had no interest in SSI because they never saw them. Mm. You know, and I suspect if they did see an SSI, the first thing they'd prescribe was an antibiotic. Um, but they are very powerful in the UK. I mean, they've got the MRSA and C different. <coughs> I mean, I'm really impressed by what's happening. We're faced now with MDR gonorrhea. We're faced with MDR TB in the UK. And it's a really major problem. People aren't really taking that seriously. But SSIs have got to be led by, I think, surgical teams, mm. not microbiologists. And I, by that, I mean the infection control mm. staff should be involved as well. But, yeah, it is difficult. I don't think anything's an accident. You know, we've stopped calling road traffic accidents accidents. They're now RTCs in the UK, road traffic collisions, because there's always a cause. Somebody not quite watching what they're doing, going too fast. You know, clamps drop off bell because you haven't put them on properly. 
or because somebody's been clumsy and pushed it off. There's always a cause, um, and it happens to us all. I'm not saying it never happens to me, of course it did. But you know, there's often a surgical mishap which you can almost directly relate. People have done this and said, was there any time in the operation where you had a problem? And he used to say, yeah, you had a hypotensive period of 15 minutes. I don't know what the cause of it was, but I told you this patient's blood pressure's dipped. It could have been a bacteremic episode, it could have been a blood loss episode, had been quite corrected well, but when you connect those with outcomes, there's a very close correlation. But surgeons and anaesthetists have to be persuaded to really recount that kind of mishap. But uh, they do occur. Yeah. Uh, would anyone else in the panel comment on that? The, if the attitude towards the infections would be... Oh, sorry, I will address the question. Uh, I'm just curious to see if you think that the attitude towards the SSIs, for instance, uh, if that could change the way we treat them or spend energy and resources trying to avoid them. Anyone? Well, it's nice to have the microbiologists on board. They have the power. Yeah. But I think it would be useful yeah. to get primary care teams in as well, yeah. to be honest. Klaus? Well, of course, money talks. Uh, mm -hmm. If you, uh, on your department, have an effect of economy of a higher or lower uh, incidence of infection, of course, it mm -hmm. will change things. Mm -hmm. We have a question here. Uh. Yes. Thank you very much for the really exciting discussion. Um, but I think I have a couple of things. I think first is a comment. Um, I think if we're going to work together the best of your plan, I think we have to look at the workflow of reducing SSI by dividing the co patient cohort, meaning that the non-oncological cohort and the oncological cohort, for example, uh, in orthopedics and in cardiothoracics, and a different meaning in terms of acute surgery. In oncological cohorts, I think we are time-pressed. We have patients who have uh, SVN, so they have to be done within two weeks, or etc. And the next thing I want to say is, is, is really a question. Uh, we don't seem to have touched base on um, the emerging cohort of patients where the starting point is patients who have been uh, pre-treated with chemotherapy and also pre-treated with straw behandling, mm -hmm. radiation. And especially in the oncological breast surgical world, uh, where a lot of patients now actually have been pre-treated pre with uh, radiation mm -hmm. before they actually get their ca cancer cell. Yeah. So my question is, is, would you add anything more to the five things that you just yeah. said, Dr. Lipa? And we need to... Uh, yeah. have been pre-treated with radiation. Yeah. And we still have to come to the fifth on the list. We, we're just, we, we're down to four. We, we, we'll take the fifth. Uh, but who wants to start with this excellent question? Would you like hyperglycemia as the fifth, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, uh, the th there's no doubt that neoadjuvant chemo and radiotherapy in bowel and breast delay wound healing. We know mm. that. But it's the same, for me, difficulty. Is it a dehiscence where wound healing mm. is delayed? that might be biofilm and bacteria related, or is it a genuine infection? Um, I mean, it's a really hard question to answer that. Maybe I didn't ask my question mm. clearly, but I apologize for that. So my specific question was, would you extend your ex antibiotic Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's any evidence from quite big studies uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, which were many, many hundreds and thousands of patients that having neoadjuvant chemotherapy actually did increase the number of infections. But there are certainly delays in healing. There's more leaks after colorectal surgery after neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, but it's evidence to extend it. No, there isn't any, but it seems logical. I accept what you're saying. But antibiotics don't make things heal quicker. You know, the consequence of poor healing and leakage is still going to be there. If you see what I mean. Mm. <laughs> Annette, you mentioned uh, the condition of the patient, as, and Klaus, using the same slide, also mentioned it. But the, the, how do you prep the patient and to be as fit as possible before surgery uh, to promote wound healing and, and 
reduce the risk of infection. Um, is that taken uh, well, well, as seriously? Well, I said before, I think we can do much more uh, in all types of surgery and, and uh, uh, using that time the patients are waiting to, to come to the, to the OR for surgery. And of course, especially those really susceptible to infections like uh, our cancer patients, we can try to use these two or three weeks to prep these patients mm. really good to, to make sure they have a blood level, uh, blood sugar levels that are okay uh, and uh, nutrition wise and, and things like that. Lifestyle? Lifestyle issues yeah. like yeah. Smoking, smoking and alcohol. Yeah, yeah of course. Mm. We, we can we can use that in much more extensive. Mm. Uh, and I think maybe we can also try to under, to to improve the the um, surgical environment for patients who are really susceptible to infections, to work a bit harder with those patients in the OR, because it's really obvious to see that there are different kinds of safety cultures uh, uh, that are associated with patients' types. Uh, and um, in orthopedics, it's really obvious that what the orthopedic surgeon thinks is important, we will do in the OR. But if you go to another uh, OR, maybe they have a other uh, culture, which means that they do not use um, the safety measures uh, fully. <coughs> and that could be improved, mm. I think. Lina. Um, just would like to mention, I think some of you guys in the audience may know also about this. There are quite a lot of initiatives uh, uh, with solutions that could actually help mm. uh, preparing the patient for surgery. And uh, it could be a digital solution for those patients who like that, but it could be something mm. else too. But typically there is something where we can support also with the collaboration from um, developers within mm. the industry of different kinds yeah. to, to help preparing, to help mm. also stop this cancellation with the surgery that uh, cannot be performed yeah. because of bad preparation, etc. We have a few of those, those examples in region of yeah. Oh, yeah, the, that's right. And the, there are a few initiatives like that that almost like... Clausis project, but before surgery, yeah, exactly. so to speak, yeah. help the patient prepare uh, mentally and physically yeah. um, before yeah. before the surgery. So that's typically an example where the healthcare system needs to work together with the industry and also of course, yeah. with the patient's perspective in focus, because mm -hmm. one solution doesn't fit all patients. That's, no. that's for sure. That's for sure. And it's probably not one. It's many um, initiatives. The fifth on the list. <laughs> I think glucose control is, is, is important, of course. But, but at least uh, it's been shown to, to reduce mm. virtually all kinds of complications, yeah. including infections, if you have a good control. Mm. It might not be so strict that we have used here mm. over the last years, uh, because you have also always the risk of hyperglycemia yeah. uh, so so, so uh, there, there was a discuss yeah. at which level but yeah. but control is important and nutrition in general i guess but because in in the 90s there was a lot of talk about when you introduced the fast track surgery concept and and one part of that was making this the patient fitter before surgery and nutrition was uh, a part of that um I, I don't hear that as often anymore. Is that because it's, if, it, it wasn't it as effective as it uh, was promised? You know, it's difficult. It, it was easy on your, one of your slides. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you could, uh, but somebody with a yeah. BMI of 40 is clearly malnutrited as well, but oh. they do yeah. so well with hyperbaric. Um. Oh, sorry, bariatrics. Yeah. But, I mean, the surgical trauma and, and all of that, and, and how, the, how the patient... We've got to chuck in our anaesthetists, too, mm. to be honest, because I've seen anaesthesia in my 50 years. I qualified in 1970, for And I've seen huge advances in anaesthesia. Now, and the anaesthetists now have our patients in very good homeostasis through the whole operation, you know. They're well-prepared. They're often part mm. of preoperative preparation. Yeah. And during the surgery, their blood pressure... Mm urine output are all monitored with much greater care. Yeah. They're kept warm, they're kept well suffused, yeah. 
their oxygenation with things like SAO2 mm. and so on. All that's come in and we've kind of just, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Mm. But you know, there were lots of studies showing that if you hyper-oxygenate patients, they have less SIs. Mm. And the NICE evaluation threw that out because our anaesthetists wouldn't let you start operating if the SA2 was under, say, 97 or 96. You know, there's something not right here. Let's work this out. Mm. Okay, so all that extra oxygen and fluid and stuff is... I don't think in modern anaesthesia there's a role. I mean, what they do for our patients is staggeringly mm. good. Apart from getting them mm. cold, having the durals. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that should be borne in mind. Hyperoxygenation, I'm sure, is needed. Mm. They all get optimal oxygenation. Well, they should. Yeah. Lina, uh, when you look at all the projects that you get, your department gets involved in, um, do you get the feeling that the area of SSI is one that interests many people? Is it a big product for you, so to speak? Well, quite frankly, not in the small, well, the portfolio that we mm. handle, uh, it's not a large portfolio. No. We have a couple of projects where Annette is involved in one of them, for mm. example. Very interesting. Um, but not if you look at the big majority. No. Um, not saying that is not interesting, but we haven't, they haven't come to us uh, that much, no. Which, do you think it's a sign of, <coughs> of something? Because it was, Anne-Marie was here, and mentioned how important it was for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. The economy, uh, patients, resources in terms of beds and, and so on. And Anders, like the most economically sound thing you can do is avoid uh, an infection. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know really, but it's a very interesting question mm -hmm. because um, as I said, it's not that it's not happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, as we have seen today, are doing a lot of research mm. and uh, prove in everyday yeah. uh, surgery and in other clinics too, of course. Um. But we have a few examples where collaboration has been, or is what I think, mm. quite um, uh, quite uh, successful. Mm. Uh, we're looking very much forward on the project that is going on in Mandal now, where collaboration mm. both between clinics and a couple of companies of big size and small mm. size which I hope will in a couple of years find uh, new solutions and test new solutions for, for decrease uh, this health care of yeah. patients. And there are a few others. And hopefully spread both in the region and, and the rest of the country. Does the audience have any questions? Yes. The effect of yeah. using clean air suits, if you didn't hear in the back. Yeah. Does anyone have? I've never, uh, I've never uh, done it. So is, it's, is it in orthopedics, maybe, that you've used it? Something uh, you might look at again. Yeah, I mean, there has been done a lot of research uh, newly about uh, clean air suits, and, and they, they are effective to hinder the migration of uh, uh, skin flakes and, um, and bacteria from the person who works there into the air. However, I think that the effect is, is relative and has to be, because all this is about uh, the importance of clean air, and there are many ways to, to achieve clean air in the operating room. So if you have a really poor uh, ventilation system and old, then uh, it would be worth to to use clean air suits, given that you you keep the doors shut, because it would be a, a poor investment to to use clean air suits and then have about 60 door openings per surgery. Uh, and I think we need to understand more the relative use, uh, uh, the relative. Uh, advantage of, of using different types of uh, clothing systems in different type of uh, uh, ORs, uh, using different types of ventilation systems. There's not a single answer to that question. That might save you some money. Hmm? <laughs> but I bet they won't give them up. I think they like doing it, you know, it's like men on the moon sort of thing. There, there are things that are too cool to throw out. Yeah, there are. <laughs> uh, we're, 
We're nearing the end here, but I would like to go around the panel with really two questions. You need to list the most important thing that you would like to see in terms of reducing the SSIs. Uh, really difficult, and it will be more difficult for the person last in line than for the one who's first. But in uh, mentioning that action or device or process or decision or whatever, also say whether you think it's a bigger problem not doing what we know to be effective rather than uh, not knowing what is effective, if you understand the difference. Klaus, would you like to begin? Yes, uh, it's a typical thing I say here. Because uh, I think that the infection control unit, the surgical unit, the orthopedic unit, and maybe the anesthesia should sit together and decide what should we do. Mm. So mm. everyone knows that. And mm -hmm. we focus on that. Mm. Short answer. See. Yeah, no, very good. And do you think it's, is it more a bigger problem that we don't do what we know to be effective than that our knowledge base is not big enough? I think it's equal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anders. Uh, what I would like to have is a very good surrogate endpoint. Meaning? Not being, I mean, what we sometimes argues is that PFU per so and so. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so if we could have a good um, surrogate endpoint that actually uh, uh, is showing the, the because it's so difficult to mm. show changes in infection rate because mm. it's so multifactorial. But if yeah. we could have something that, that actually give us better guidance, mm -hmm. if, I mean, people are now trying to sell new solutions based on how many platforming units yeah. or, or whatever it's called. Uh, so, so that was, I'm, I'm okay. it's, it's warranted. I don't think we use whatever we can. Mm. And uh, finally, we didn't mention among these five things the surgical technique, which I think everything mm. starts with, that the good surgeon has less infections than yeah. a bad surgeon. So going back to Halstead and his principles and exactly. skill, yeah, I, I agree. David? I'm not sure I agree with that. Hmm? Because I've seen okay. surgeons who do that with huh? surgery and they have the lowest SSI rates because hmm? they're quick and so on. Uh, but I think we all respect tissues. I mean, we, we teach all our young mm. surgeons to do that, but it's very hard to measure it. Mm. I, mean, I think what I'd like to do is sit down with this audience for a week and <laughs> redefine exactly what we mean by an SSI, what's relevant, mm. what's significant, what isn't. Mm. And maybe let's say, um, let's have a multidisciplinary mm. group across this, as so I'll have ward, theatre, mm. recovery room, and home. Mm to sort of look at and, and share the cost mm. uh, and sort of have the... We don't have procurement mm. uh, in our country, but it would be good to have the procurement managers really yeah. look at that as a collective yeah. and then maybe decide on a bundle and just see if it really works. I mean, scientifically, you might put five things together and they might not work. Mm. One might negate another. We just don't know. No. But I think it's something that I would love to see done. Yeah. And if it were done, then the, it would be nice to pressurise our... Departments of Health to say, look, this is worth doing. It could save potentially mm. a lot of money. Mm. So pretty much what you wanted to see, Klaus. And, and do you think we do what we know to be effective uh, rather than not know it enough? Are we using the science we have? But that, that question I was supposed to... I was no, no, I, no, I, I was uh, actually because, uh, David, you... Make better use of what we have, yeah, ah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, a lot of surgeons haven't got a clue what their SSI no. rate. A lot don't care. No. Um, some, you could argue, don't mm. so much. But, you know, in breast surgery, we were talking about it earlier, mm. um, if you have a, an SSI and it delays your mm. adjuvant chemotherapy mm. or radiotherapy, that's a disaster. Yeah. If you have a, a knee that falls apart, it's a disaster. Yeah. Um, you know, it goes on. Same with you, you know, when, you, when you have a sternum that falls mm. apart, but... Some things are relatively trivial. I, I just get upset when just a bead of pus and a knee that's fallen apart are both called an SSI. Yeah. It just needs re-looking at. 
Yeah. What's the severity? That's what counts. Yeah. And that's where funds perhaps should be pushed. Mm. These are the infections we must prevent. Yeah. I mean, I know they're rare. <laughs> you see one or two of those a year, yeah. probably. Anette? Uh, yeah, it's difficult to be, yeah. be the last in the row, but, and I fully agree with what you all said. And um, teamwork and interprofessional co collaboration is important to set goals together and to work with them and to follow up our patients so we can see what we are doing is, act, is effective. I would also say something that is absolutely crucial is that uh, uh, the leadership values safety just as much as production. Yeah. Thank you. And Lina, you will get to have the final comment then, because you have a different approach than the medical... Uh... Um, yeah, so I'll skip the thing about the knowledge, because I really have no clue. <laughs> uh, but I would like to... I really like the guys you're talking about teamwork, uh, different multidisciplinary. Um, what I do lack in that discussion so far, and I don't think it's obvious uh, to everybody, is to include the patient's self. I mean, make sure that that person who's actually been cut up or is involved in... Uh, sort of decreasing uh, all the SSI and uh, anything else because he or she will definitely have an influence on that, I'm sure. Um, and of course also because we have a lot of clever guys and people from other parties like business companies that have solutions uh, that you have to develop from whatever the guys on my side here yeah. are expressing. You, you guys know the needs, the patients yeah. know the needs and the problems. But the demand-driven innovation. Maybe yeah. always developed yeah. within the health yeah. so help us. Yeah. Well, you've proven me right, um, which I'm very happy about, because I ventured out and said that you were the most competent panel ever assembled um, in the history of panels. <laughs> and I was taking a chance. As individuals, you are obviously extremely talented, but uh, you proved the thing that uh, Anette points out that points out as very important that teamwork also uh, works well. And uh, I would like to thank the panel for taking such a, uh, a good approach to this and all sharing your knowledge and also discussing this very interesting topic. We're never done with this topic. It will, it will continue for sure. Uh, so thank you very much uh, and applause. Uh,